As the Buddha commented one time, our reaction to suffering is two things. One is bewilderment. Why is there this pain? Why is there this suffering? And the second is a search. Is there someone who knows a way out of this suffering? And for the most part, the advice we get on finding a way out of suffering is to look for sensual pleasure. But pleasures last only so long, and we find ourselves suffering again, and there's a back and forth. You hold on to the pleasure, and you suddenly find yourself holding on to pain, as in a John Cha's image. There's a snake with teeth on one end and no teeth on the other, and you think it's safe to touch the end that has no teeth, but you find out that they're connected. Now, some people find that the pursuit of sensual pleasures is ignoble, in other words, it lowers the status of the mind. And by sensuality here we mean not only the actual pleasures themselves, but more our fascination with fantasizing about them. That's where we tend to go to first when there's pain. But we find that that pulls the mind down. So there's some people who say, well, maybe pain purifies the mind. The Buddha himself, as part of his quest, had a vision where he saw different kinds of wood. There was sappy wood that was soaking in water, and that wasn't going to be used to start a fire. There was sappy wood that was near water, taken out of the water. But the fact that it was still sappy and moist meant that he couldn't start a fire with that. Then there was dry wood, far from the water. That could be used to start a fire. So he interpreted that image in such a way that he felt he had to get away from pleasure entirely. And it's a common thing. You think about all the indulgence he had as a young man. When people tire of that indulgence or they find that they lack self-respect, then they swing to the opposite extreme. It was only after going through both extremes that he found the middle way. Now, the middle way was not a halfway feeling or a middling feeling. It was another way of getting away from pain and suffering, aside from sensual pleasure. And that was the pleasure of the mind and concentration. That was one of the first factors of the path that he discovered. A sense of ease, rapture, that comes when the mind is secluded from sensuality. It's a pleasure of form. We're inhabiting the body from the inside. We're finding pleasure in balancing the elements in the body, starting with the breath, because that's the most responsive to our, our mind, our intentions. When the Buddha contemplated this pleasure before he started on the path, he asked himself, why am I afraid that that pleasure doesn't have any drawbacks? Is it Unskillful? Is it blameworthy? There's nothing blameworthy about it. You're not harming anybody by sitting here breathing, getting sensitive to your breath. And you're also not clouding the mind. This is why part of the description is secluded from sensuality, secluded from unskillful mental states. You're not thinking about sensual pleasures at all. There are no fantasies about tomorrow's meal. If there are, it's not part of the concentration. You're trying to lift the quality of the mind. Because after all, how are you going to understand sensuality unless you can step outside of it? And how can you escape from it? How can you step outside of it unless you have an alternative form of pleasure? As the Buddha said, if you don't have this form of pleasure or something higher, and no matter how much you may see the drawbacks of sensuality, you're still going to go back. Because the mind needs pleasure. It's part of its food. So a supply of pleasure that's apart from sensuality, one in which you can look at your sensual clinging and look at your sensual craving from the outside, and not automatically side with these things. When the Buddha describes his 
description of suffering and the cause of suffering as noble truths. Some people complain. They say, what's noble about suffering? What's noble about craving? What's noble about the truth is that you're standing back from these things. I know the different forms of clinging and different forms of craving, sensual clinging, sensual craving, have no rule on the path at all. The other forms of clinging and craving do have a role. As you're getting the mind into concentration, it's based on a desire for becoming. You're trying to give rise to a state in the mind. You're trying to annihilate any other mental states that come up. So craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming do play a role as you're trying to master the skills of concentration. The same with clinging. There's no role for sensual clinging. But there is a role for habits and practices. You've got the habits of the precepts and you've got the practices of concentration. Views, a right view, and even a sense of self of someone who's capable of doing this and will benefit from doing it. Those forms of clinging do play a role in the path. But you notice that when the Buddha talks about how you, when you gain right view or hear right view for the first time, you start thinking about what the implications are, and you realize that any thinking that's going to pull you into sensuality is something you've got to say no to. That's the first right resolve. So in order to strengthen yourself, your ability to step back from sensuality. And to see it for what it is, you've got to have this alternative pleasure. This applies not only in right concentration, but also right mindfulness, because the two are actually the same process. Right mindfulness is how you get the mind into right concentration. Now think of the Buddha's images. When you're practicing right mindfulness, you're like that quail in the field that's been newly plowed. Stones are all turned up. And it can hide behind the stones if a hawk comes to get it. If it wanders outside of the field, it's easy prey. And outside of the field is what? The five strings of sensuality. Which means that when you're engaged in mindfulness practice, it's not a matter of just watching whatever comes up. Good, bad, indifferent, sensual, non-sensual. You're actively placing a fence around the mind that's going to stay here with the the body in and of itself, and not wander off into sensual pleasures. Then as you get to do that more and more thoroughly, more and more consistently, the mind goes into right concentration, where sensuality plays no role. And you're able to find this alternative pleasure, the pleasure of inhabiting the body fully, with a sense of the breath energy filling the body, a sense of ease filling the body. And then from there you work up to the higher and higher levels of concentration. But it's right here where the Buddha gained awakening. He didn't gain awakening by indulging in sensual thoughts. He realized there was another alternative to pain. He made it a central part of the path. You look at the factors for the path. Think back to when we chant them. The first two have to do with discernment, the next three have to do with virtue, and the last three have to do with concentration. And those last three are far longer than the others, explained in a lot more detail. They really are the heart of the path, and they're what makes the middle way the middle way, because they provide a pleasure that keeps you from going back to sensual pleasures and it helps you not getting immersed in pain. Even in passages where the Buddha says some people have to practice more painfully than others, his definition of painful is a meditation theme. We have to do a lot of work on contemplating the body. But you also develop the five faculties, including right concentration. So you're not totally immersed in pain. Now there are sensual pleasures that are actually okay. He says he doesn't say no to all sensual pleasures. He says, however, that you have to notice which kinds of pleasures you indulge in 
that have a bad effect on the mind and which ones have no bad effect on the mind. If they have a bad effect on the mind, you've got to avoid them. And that means not only avoiding the pleasure, but also avoiding fantasizing about them. So again, you find that you have to maintain this sense of well-being that comes from inhabiting the body, staying with the breath, working with the breath energies. If you're going to have any chance of pulling yourself out of sensuality and finding a noble truth inside the mind. So this is what the Buddha is talking about when he talks about the middle way. The pleasure that's not on the continuum between self-torture and total indulgence. It's off the continuum. It's a different kind of pleasure entirely, what he calls pleasure not of the flesh, which we have to work to give rise to. But as we give rise to it, we develop a lot of good qualities in the mind, which again is another way that this pleasure differs from sensual pleasure. Sensual pleasure you can enjoy without having to develop any special qualities, but to gain the pleasure of right concentration you need mindfulness, you need alertness, discernment, tranquility, insight. All of which are good qualities to exercise. And this is one of the reasons why it is such a useful pleasure, why it's a special pleasure that should be actively pursued. You hear so much about the dangers of getting stuck in the pleasure of jhana. The Buddha talks a little bit about that, where his image is of a person who's got some sap on his hand, grabs hold of a branch. His hand may stick, but there are solvents to get rid of that sap. It's a worse, much worse attachment if you're attached to sensuality, because that can lead you to do all kinds of things that go against the path. What was the only problem with being attached to the pleasure of concentration is that you may hang out here too long, not be willing to do further work. But that can be cured, and in the meantime it's a lot less harmful. So this is a pleasure to be actively pursued. Because it's good for the mind in so many ways.